Hello, everybody. Welcome to Conversations with Peter Bogosian. Today, we're joined by Lionel Shriver. She's an American author and journalist best known for her novel, We Need to Talk About Kevin. Her work explores complex societal and human relationships, and welcome to the show. Thanks for talking to me today. I've been looking forward to it. Okay, great. So you're, you're in, you moved to Portugal from the UK, is that right? That's correct. And you, uh, okay, so you moved to Portugal from the UK, and how long were you in the UK? 36 years. 36 years. And why did you move? Why did you do that? Well, not to put too fine a point on it, the country is falling apart. And I would rather watch that painful show from a distance. Okay. Uh, so what are the three things that, that the three causes of your perception? Well, before we do that, just give us a little bit of your background. So are you, do you say that like you have training as an eco economist, you have training as a social theorist, you have training in like, what qualifies you to make that judgment, if anything? Um, oh, very little, but I do read a lot of newspapers. Um, and uh, I'm, pro I'm a professional dabbler. So I, I indulge serial obsessions, that otherwise known as novels. <laughs> and so, I mean, for example, when I was working on uh, the mandibles, which came out in 2016, I was consumed with economics um, because it's about what happens in the United States when the dollar collapses yeah, in, the, in the future. Yeah, well, um, that, that's so, that's another one of my areas of depressing interest. But okay, so keep going. Yeah. So so, so what was it about the UO? What was it about the? Because um, Reed and I were just there. I think we spent three months there. Why do why are you not rosy on the future of the UK? I'm very worried about their energy policy. Uh, it's likely they're going to start experiencing blackouts at least by 2028, if not before. They've already got uh, the grid paying people to not run appliances during peak times in the winter. Uh, and and they just don't have a plan. So they're taking all these power plants offline, but they're not building any to speak of. And yet they mm -hmm. are expecting everyone to get an electric car and install a heat pump. And this does not compute. And I think that just in general, that's a sign of the fact that British politicians are not serious people. And they don't, you know, it's, it, it's, like a gentleman's pursuit and I can, not assure, I can assure, yeah, I can assure you having spent time there and spoken to many, many British politicians, <laughs> they have the lowest of the low. <laughs> a yeah, we think we've got it bad. <laughs> of us at, the national, at the national level, maybe, maybe not at the state level. Okay. So energy policy is one thing. What else? What else? Why do you think that the, the U S is, um, the UK, UK. is not doing well? Um, they have uh, bought the whole woke agenda from the United States hook, line, and sinker so that they are suffering from the same kind of fungal infection at an institutional level that the U S is. Uh, and that's going to be just as difficult to get rid of. Uh, and, uh, you know, it's not even original. I mean, it's just copying from the United States, which I find particularly undignified. Uh, and also, you know, going through COVID in the UK was really disillusioning. I mean, here's this, you know, land of the Magna Carta. And, and uh, in many ways, many of our political conventions came from the UK. It's a place that's always prided itself as as a you know big on free speech all the all the rights that Americans have uh, put in their constitution or are, are, have at least been assumed uh, unconstitutionally because they don't actually have a written constitution but it's okay. certainly a big part of common law and then um, during COVID it was all out the window and literally overnight that okay you had no rights and I, it's just 
And and by the way, it was a lot worse in the UK than in the US. The lockdowns were longer and harder and and crazier, really stupid. Uh, like um, there was a period that you had to order a so-called substantial meal in a pub or you couldn't have a drink. And then there were these big debates as to whether a scotch egg uh, qualified as a substantial meal. And as oh, I like scotch and eggs. Well, you actually have these politicians talking about it on air, about, you know, whether it's caloric enough. I believe it is mm. caloric enough. It's fried. Okay, so <laughs> we have we have the <clears throat> rolling blackouts or the blackouts, the energy policy. We have the problem with the people who go into politics and politics in general. We have the lockdowns. Is that it, or do you want to add one more thing to that list? I think it's grown increasingly authoritarian, um, which follows on from the lockdowns, but uh, it shows itself in, in the way people, in the way politicians and people in general respond to any problem. It's by banning things and passing punitive laws so that you, you have to pay fines. You know, the places is, is addicted to fines. Local governments are addicted to fines. That's how they finance themselves. So it's a very punitive polity. And that's not a good feeling. Okay. And all they actually things. had fines during COVID that if you, you know, if you were, or if you organized a protest, for example, against COVID lockdowns, you were fined 10,000 pounds. And that's, you know, like $13,000. Yeah, 12, yeah, 13, yeah. Okay, so all of those things in conjunction, first of all, I was very surprised that you named those things and not other things, but all of those things in conjunction were sufficient to cause you to move to Portugal. Yes, and I would add that for, I mean, if I'm going to be totally honest, for Americans, there's nothing work worse tax-wise than being an American in the UK. Uh they have a completely Why? different and totally perverse tax year. It goes from April 6th to April 5th. And yet if you stay there long enough, they expect you, expect you to declare your worldwide income, which I also have to declare to the United States with these. And therefore your tax reporting documents don't match up at all. Your taxes and, and the money don't match up, if you know what I mean. So... And, and so you end up getting, you're, supposedly there's a tax, double taxation treaty, but in truth, you end up getting, getting double taxed all the time. So, the, you know, I was really surprised when you told me you were in Portugal. I would never move to Portugal. I would, Why I so? would, well, because I think that I'm a huge fan of Eastern Europe. I would absolutely mm -hmm. move to Eastern Europe. I would move to Hungary as topping that list. Croatia's mm -hmm. on the list. Maybe Poland, Bratislava. Life. Over I might have considered just... that if it weren't for the fact that we have a number of friends who have moved here, and I didn't want to move into a completely uh, cold social situation where I didn't have a single uh, single friend, and and it was very helpful that there was a small community already here. Yeah, I can I can totally understand that. The, I like Portuguese wine. Yeah, I do too. Do you drink wine? Do a you drink lot of reds. It. All red. Oh, really? Yeah. Oh, excellent. What's your favorite type of wine? Well, it better be Portuguese wine. <laughs> um, I I like the Douros, uh, and I like the 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 wines from Alentejo. Excellent. I'm I'm turning read on to various types of wine now. My favorite, I'm in a Chianti phase. Very mm. dry. It's hard to find. I just went to the Magic Castle the other night. It's a place here in LA with a friend of ours who's a magician. And I asked for a um a Chianti. And both the bartender and my friend Marcy laughed at me. And I thought that was just such an unusual, I mean, like it's odd. <laughs> I thought that was such an unusual thing. So I eventually got a mixed drink. Okay. Anyway, m moving right along. I'm just curious. So um, you, t you're, you write novels. Mm -hmm. uh, that's something that I wish I had more time to do is, well, just had more time, but um, read novels. 
what what or read fiction in particular i tend to watch my fiction and read my nonfiction. what is um what's your new novel about well i have one coming out in april called mania and it's set in the near past starts in 2011 uh and it suddenly be, seizes the western world this notion that all people are equally smart and cognitive discrimination is the last great civil rights fight. So you can't oh, call people so cool. stupid anymore or the S word. Uh, and obviously this kicks off what is effectively the total end of meritocracy. That's fascinating. And my mentor told me a story once that he walked into class and people did not do well in a test that he had been giving for a number of years. And he said, well, I can't believe how many stupid people there are in here. And the people in the class said, you can't call people stupid. <laughs> Excuse me. And he said, well, can, can I call people smart? And they said, yes. And he said, well, if there's no smart, how can there be like, you, you have to have one without the other. Those things are conjoined. I think he was making, making a larger point, but you know, Heather McDonald writes about uh, the, the demeaning of the meritocracy. Is that something that you see coming down the pike in the future, the, the further demeaning of the of meritocracy? Well, the whole point of this book was to position it a, a single millimeter away from where we are now. So this is just going down the route that, that we're on. And it's true that Heather McDonald has been very good about tracking that and, um, what's been happening in the name of social justice, especially in medical schools and even classical music. Um, and one of the things that happens in my novel is that contradictorily, uh, though, though the movement claims there's no such thing as stupid, at the same time, they start actively promoting stupid people. Like, there is a prejudice Absolutely. against people who are intelligent, who are conspicuously intelligent. Yeah, and all those people occupy DEI offices everywhere. Yeah. So, I mean, obviously it's going for DEI, um, but it's also going for the phenomenon of the social mania. And in some ways it's most modeled uh, in that respect on the transgender craze, which took off, or I can pinpoint it precisely, uh, as starting in 2012, when suddenly the televisions were chaka with documentaries about children who decided that they were born the wrong sex. I've never, I've never seen anything take off so fast or so furiously and so far so lastingly. Uh, can, and, I, we... and I find that, I find, you know, we've, we've been subject to repeated social manias in, in the last uh, 10 or 15 years. Uh, Me Too was another one, went international all over the place, uh, started out sound and rapidly went insane. Um, Black Lives Matter was another one, which especially just went bananas after George Floyd until you had people marching in the streets in South Korea uh, for Black Lives Matter, and they don't even have any black people. Or or you'd have um, people marching down the street in London and saying, hands up, don't shoot. And uh, their cops don't carry guns. So it's these social manias, they have an element of insanity to them, uh, and certainly unthinkingness and and kind of hysterical conformism. And what intrigues me, and I, you were actually talking to Helen Joyce about this, there's a small class of people who simply are not, uh, they're not prone to catching these social viruses. They just don't. And I, yeah, I think I'm one of them and I think you are also. Let's linger on that because that's fascinating to me. I've, I've asked a lot of people that question. And I, I so just to be clear, here, here's the question. Why is it that some people are more prone to 
I don't know what, how one would something morally fashionable or these social contagions or the the this this new suite of beliefs that we have now. Why is it that some people are prone to that and other people? And I'm leaving myself. You know, this is not a self-aggrandizement show. Like, why is it that that other people are not susceptible or at, nearly as susceptible to that? Of course, for me, the mystery is why are those other people susceptible to it? And that's the part that I don't understand. I do understand really, that, not being I, susceptible to it. I can tell you my the experience. In, in, I can in say analyzing, the to that. Well, in, in analyzing it, it's almost impossible not to um, to sound vain and self-flattering because it seems to me it does have something to do with the capacity for independent thought and also a, a, a compulsive desire to be liked and approved of. Uh, and, and that somehow is blinding that you get the message that this is what you're supposed to think and this is what you're supposed to say. And, you know, larger social approval is more important to you than what we would perceive as, intellectual integrity. So I apologize that, that that makes us sound as if we think we're special. I don't want to be special in this regard. I, I don't I don't understand why people don't stop and and think. And a lot of it is cowardice. And and so you know it's it's one of the great mysteries when people sign up to this stuff and it you know they didn't say anything about Black Lives Matter yesterday and suddenly we see this news report and then now it's, you know, it's the center of your life and you have a, a sign on your your house and you have a bumper sticker on your car. Uh, some of these people are just going through the motions. But there are other people who really get caught up in it and at least think they believe in it. And are vicious toward anyone who doesn't get on board. It's, you know, COVID was another example. I mean, that people abdicated their rights and their freedoms, which until that moment they had regarded as, you know, what, what, what Americans would call inalienable. Um, inalienable, there's something difficult to pronounce about that word. Um, and, then the, and then then it was like, never mind. You know, it's okay. The government can tell me that I can't leave my house, right? Or, you know, I have to have a reason to leave my house. I have to have an excuse. In other words, I have to stay home. That's totally normal. And then, then we start turning in people who, who have gone out to exercise more than once in a day, and we, we tell the police. Now, I, I, to me, that's the mystery. Not that we... <laughs> <laughs> not that we're not on board, but that they are. And I mean, I don't understand it, but at the same time, the fact of it, the fact that most people are like that does explain a huge amount of human history. So after COVID and all these other manias, but especially COVID, I find all kinds of historical phenomena that I used to find mysterious, baffling, and obviously upsetting. They're still upsetting, but they're not baffling to me anymore. I mean, Pol Pot makes perfect sense to me. The, the Holocaust makes perfect sense to me. The fact that Germany got on board with the Holocaust, pretended they didn't know it was happening, or sort of did, but were fine with it, right? Yep. I can see it. I actually decided that, you know, for for the UK to convert to national so socialism would probably take about three weeks. So, do, okay. So do you have any beliefs that you harbor about reality that you think fall into the domain of morally fashionable? So... In other words, it's easy for us to sit here and criticize people who have fallen to this most recent ideology. But it's a reasonable question, I think, to ask, well, what beliefs do you have that are under evidence that you hold? 
I guess you could say a belief in freedom of speech is is morally fashionable. It has traditionally been fashionable for Americans. Um, it is no longer fashionable among you know who. Uh, but do. uh, I don't consider myself in especially brave in embracing the concept. Uh, it has become required bravery to exercise freedom of speech, but believing in it is a, is sort of it's obviously easy. It's one of the reasons I'm, I'm fascinated by the fact that whenever you talk about the topic, I don't mean you personally, we us talk about the topic of freedom of speech, it puts everyone to to sleep. It's really boring in the abstract. It's only interesting when you get down to particular instances. Uh, where people ruin their careers because they say something that you might think was self-evident or at least should be possible to say without having your head cut off. But and, as, and a, you, as an issue, it's, it's actually kind of tedious. And you've certainly said things that bumped up against the orthodoxy, potentially cancel cancelable offenses. Oh, more and more. And... You know, one of the things that got me into hot water in the UK was making fun of the affirmative action uh, commitments uh, of uh, Penguin Random House in the UK. And, yeah, I remember that. you know, one of the things that made people so angry is that it was a lighthearted column and it was funny. <laughs> yeah, the you know, humor people, thing, when you do it with humor, it. it's all... They hate, they hate it, they can't take it. And you must never make a joke within a mile of the word diversity. So, and furthermore, you know, I, I've been an opponent of uh, affirmative action since I was 16 years old, which is when it first came in into fashion in, in the U S and uh, I just instinctively didn't like it. And that was at a time when I was under the sway of traditional democratic liberal, you know, anti Vietnam war, uh, go recycling, uh, uh, you know, parents, <laughs> and yeah, let's, um, let's, and I and, and 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 yet even then, even then, I didn't like it. It 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 seemed wrong to discriminate on in order to solve discrimination. Okay, let's linger on this. I, I'm going to steel man. I'm increasingly uh, steel manning positions because I can't find anybody to talk to me who's on the other side. So I'm going to steel man the. Uh, affirmative action thing. To be clear, I don't believe this, but that's okay. People are going to meme it out, clip it out a thousand times. Um, <clears throat> so I'm going to construct an argument for affirmative action for you, and you tell me what you think of this argument. How's that? Okay. Okay. Oh, and then someone, someone said in the comments, I think questioning someone like that would go over better. Peter started off by giving an example of his own questionable beliefs. I have a lot of questionable beliefs. Mm -hmm. Um, eating animals would be would be one of them. Okay, so <clears throat> so the argument for affirmative action. Um, there are systems in place, legacy legacy systems of discrimination in which if we don't try to either aim for proportional representation among certain groups or if we don't try to remediate those past oppressions, we will create a permanent underclass of people. What's the argument against that? Okay, first off, we, we can talk about the United States. We already have a permanent underclass of people, sure. and we have yeah. uh, had affirmative action <clears throat> in place for over 50 years, and it hasn't worked. Okay, so knock that out right there. Uh, and furthermore, we, are, we have aggressively been installing de facto quota systems in all kinds of industries, and so that the discrimination is working the other way. There are a lot of areas where you have, in fact, over-representation of minorities. But, uh, you know, in those instances, fundamentally, I think the major beneficiaries, especially if you get you enlarge the frame and get beyond education alone, the beneficiaries of those policies are usually middle to upper middle class people. Uh, I saw that after the whole 
George Floyd hysteria, that that the people who were really stepping into positions that they hadn't quite earned or weren't quite qualified for were clearly raised in prosperous households and already had okay. had an education. And they were the people who have really cashed in on the white guilt thing. Okay. So what's the problem with having somebody occupy a position that they did not earn? Um, well, from a societal perspective, what's most important is that they're probably not going to be doing a very good job. And that's why Heather McDonald's research into what's going on in medicine, for example, really matters. Uh, you don't want an unqualified surgeon. Uh, what I do for a living, it doesn't matter that much. I mean, if we end up publishing a few more bad novels, it's not going to kill anybody. Okay, but I'm going to push back. I'm going to push back on that. Okay. Okay. So, so isn't the assumption inherent in that, for example, that we have an underqualified surgeon, that being able to to discharge the responsibilities of a surgeon is more important than having diverse racial representation among surgeons. Yes. Okay, but that itself is, what is the basis of that judgment? Um, because, because competence in that particular field can potentially cause people either pain or dysfunction or their lives. So there's a great deal at stake. And um, but that, you know, there, that and there are lots of other circular. professions where- But that is, that is somewhat circular though, because it does assumes that the pain, suffering, and death caused by people would overweigh or, or would trump proportional racial representation. I mean, because clearly you do not see that with American Airlines, United Airlines. I mean, clearly, we see medical, I mean, that's not how people are looking at it now. So what do you see that they don't see? Harvard University would be a great example of this. I mean, we could just go down the list of companies and corporations that have DEI quotas and initiatives, and all of those people at some level believe that, that competency in a field is less important than racial proportional racial racial representation. So is couldn't it just be that you're coming at this from your own particular point of view and they're coming at that from their point of view and it's impossible for anyone out either it's impossible for anyone else external to adjudicate whose beliefs are better or there's something inherently flawed in the idea of meritocracy itself. Cuz meritocracy does not yield to proportional ra racial representation. No, it, no it doesn't but it does yield competence. And yes, it is a personal judgment on my part that I prefer to hire competent professionals than professionals that express the proper proportion of a given race or sexual orientation in the population. And yeah, that's, that's a subjective value, but I put competence above of the appearance of racial justice. Uh, furthermore, the, there's a feedback loop here because if you keep promoting people who are not competent, who are not qualified, only because of, say, their race, then you're perpetuating racism because you're undermining these people's faith in themselves because they know, they know they've, they're being promoted not because of their own excellence. Uh, and, but furthermore, you're also promoting racial prejudice in the larger society because the people who are going to use these professionals' services discover that these people are are inferior. Uh, it feeds that notion that oh, it's because they're black or something. So it 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 actually makes racism worse. And if we're if you're consider if you're concerned about so-called systemic racism, which is not a concept I especially recognize, uh, 
then meritocracy is is the way to go. Because if you believe that races are basically equal, then the differences that, that evolve are mostly have to do with inclination. But you perpetuate racism by constantly judging people on race and promoting people on race, promoting people in accordance with race is just as discriminating as it is to, you know, not give people positions because of their race. Okay. Discrimination is then, discrimination. And, okay. and, well, then, and, and in a large, in the big, the big picture, I mean, you, you want a functional society. You want people to be doing j jobs that they're good at, and that's good for everyone. So let me ask you a question. Let me ask you to steel man this argument, if if you don't mind, if this is okay. So I've asked a lot of people this, and I've never had a satisfactory answer, no matter how many times I've asked this question. So if the acceptance to elite universities was purely meritocratic, Asians would be, uh, cold climate Asians would be over 51% of the admissions of, uh, of the matriculating class at Ivy League institutions. What is the problem with that? There isn't a problem. I know, but you're going to steal a minute. So you're going to tell me what would someone smart say who thought there was a problem with that? I've yet to receive a satisfactory answer with the, what the problem with that is. What is your best argument for what the problem with that could be? Because nobody seems to know every time I ask someone, it seems to be a big mystery to them. I don't know. We're, we're going to let Asians take over the world. <laughs> Maybe they will. Yeah. Okay. So, so, okay. Well, let me, let me ask you this. Let me ask you this question then. If, if it could be shown to your satisfaction through evidence, data points, et cetera, that cold climate Asians were, were more intelligent than white people, like normed out on virtually every metric. Would you feel angry, jealous, resentful, or bitter knowing that fact? I know that fact. And how I know does that, that make fact. you feel? And it does, does not make, make me feel angry, jealous, or bitter. In fact, uh, if you look at uh, intelligence between males and females, they're roughly similar, but the tails are much longer for men. Which means yeah, on the, the bell curve. The, uh, so yeah, yeah. The, it means yeah. that, okay, there are more very stupid men. There are. And I've met a few of them. <laughs> but there are also many more hyper intelligent men. There are many like more Reed. geniuses among men. Like, I see like no Reed. reason. And I, I, I feel comfortable talking about the sex thing because it, it's to my disadvantage. And that does not make me angry bitter or resentful. I'm perfectly happy recognizing most of the geniuses, the real geniuses uh, historically have been men. And, and I think there, there probably is a biological explanation for that. And I'm cool with it. I'm not a genius. Okay. So, cool so, that too. <laughs> you're, so you're, you're an incredibly popular uh, best-selling author. Uh, who writes amazing work. So I guess we'd have to figure out what we meant by genius. But so, um, so you're not, you don't have any negative perceptions or negative feelings about the fact that men tend to be smarter than women. I didn't or, say actually, that. That's, 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 that's not, the, that's not the right. Frame Although if that were demonstrated that, conclusively to me, I would, I would live with it. I've, after all, averages don't mean anything in the individual instance. So it, it wouldn't make me any dumber to learn that on average men are smarter. In this particular yeah, so instance, actually I, I, I know I, I, at the tail end of the distribution is what right. I said that I was, I was sloppy with my speech. I'm sorry. Okay. Let's go back to the racial thing then. So if, uh, so it doesn't bother you at all. If the, if the students who matri matriculated into the top schools tended to be uh, cold climate Asians and Ashkenazi Jews. No, it doesn't. It means that what you know what they're training for they're they're suited to those professions, and they'll be good at them. 
Okay, so now relating this back to merit, do you think that that two things that this would cultivate a feeling among say we don't have to talk about black people, white people that they were somehow subordinate or inferior and that this this not having proportional representation for example in the universities but we can talk about in any at surgeons or what have you don't you think that that and again i'm steel manning here don't you think that that could lend to a sense of resentment if for example your surgeons are asian or ashkenazi um possibly too bad feel resentful that's your problem <laughs> or that's that's the resentful person's problem i don't think we should organize our society in accordance with worrying over who might feel resentful um how should we organize our society well i'm you know i'm i'm big on merit and i think it works pretty well it's not you know no meritocracy is ever going to be perfect, perfectly just, perfectly correct. There are lots of people who are going to get through who don't deserve it. But those are forces to be resisted. The, doesn't that, again, Steele Manning, doesn't the hope or aspiration of meritocracy depend upon fair school systems, for example, fair medical treatment? Like if you're poor, you don't get as good medical treatment for your kids. You live in at least in the United States, the way that the healthcare system is set up or the tax structure is set up. So it's already not providing people with an equal opportunity. And so like merit only merit only works. Like I read an article once about, I think it was the world of Warcraft. Like um, people, people felt that because the initial starting conditions were fair, that the outcomes were just. But if people think that the initial starting conditions are not fair, then any disparity in outcomes, it could be said, is itself not fair. Life isn't fair. I mean, nature isn't fair. We're never going to have a perfectly fair society because we all, we're always going to start from different, those different positions just biologically. We're not all the same. And I think that this is really the source of the current left deep unhappiness. They can't stand inequality, never mind equity. They can't stand natural inequality. And there are the, the people are not all the same. And it isn't fair. It's not at all fair. I was in fact born probably with a natural gift for language, not entirely to my credit. I didn't, I didn't earn it. Um, there are, there are people who are really good at dance. Uh, there are people who are, who are, you know, intellectually, they're naturally gifted. They're going to like read math programs and, and other people aren't, it's not fair. Right. And you, and you know, you, that, uh, Kurt Vonnegut story, I think just about every Harrison Bergeron. This point, right. Um, yeah. where everyone's walking around, you know, the, the smart people are wearing things on their ears yeah, yeah. that interrupt their thoughts. And, and anyone who's graceful has to wear really heavy weights and, you know, and, and the reason that everyone remembers that story and Kurt Vonnegut wrote a lot of short stories. So, why do we always remember that one? Because there's something at the heart of it that's very accurate. It's like, is this the future you want? You're so, so obsessed with fairness, you know? So we're going to make everything fair. Is this nice? Is this a, is this a, so a society you want to live in? So and that's I, what I'm I think saying. You're right. you know, we're, we're elevating yeah. this notion of fairness when we can debate on what fairness is, but, but, we're elevating it to the very top of the moral pyramid. That's the highest possible value. Well, I don't think so. You know, I would, I, I, I think it's in there. A, a certain rough sense of of justice. Uh, yeah, I, I, I value that. 
And I get consternated when I read about, you know, for example, the post office scandal in the UK, where perfectly honest postmasters were screwed by a, a, a faulty uh, software system and were convicted of theft. And some of them committed suicide. And I get as outraged as anybody by that. It's, it's tragic. That is unfairness. Okay. So it's not as if I don't value that, but there are many other values uh, that we seem to no longer care about. And in some ways, you know, excellence of all kind, beauty, which, which actually doesn't have any moral qualities. That is, it, it's not, you can't call beauty evil. Um, and we don't care about this anymore. And it's, in some ways the right makes the big mistake of buying the left's hierarchy of values. So always arguing about fairness and what's fair and how can we make everything more fair? I'm kind of bored with it, making everything fair. There are other things. How about just making them work, right? Let's start there. Let's make everything work, function properly, and then maybe we can get to fairness. But we're we are prioritizing fairness or and, and a very crude version of fairness, which involves enormous amounts of unfairness. Uh, so we're really just talking about competing forms of unfairness. And that's all we argue about. And it's 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 become tedious and it, it's flattening. And it it is it's there are other conversations to be had. So you said that the left, or you didn't use the word progressives, but they were upset about inequalities. Mm -hmm. And then we talked about naturalism or the, or, or, or more specifically, there are just inequalities baked into the system. I mean, I'm five, I don't know what I am, five, nine or 10. I don't even know what I am. Uh, certain, certain people. So my, my, the likelihood that I could become an NBA basketball player, not that I would want that aspiration, but that w was close to me. There, there are just certain distributions of, of assets and physical attributes that. Yeah. And for some example, just someone who's, who's physically beautiful. I mean, like Reed talk about not fair. That's not fair. Why should some people just come out humbly? You know, why can't we all be equally fetching? And you, you can see this in, in the left wing or progressive approach to everything. In fact, in relation to physical beauty, they can't stand physical beauty. They want everyone to be equally beautiful. And we are basically being told that everyone is equally beautiful and that fat people are just as, as, as exquisite and wonderful and fetching in their own way as people who are slender. And, 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 and as if, announcing this makes it so. And, uh, and it, it's as if what the resentment is ultimately of beauty itself, because it's not fair. Yeah, having a, uh, so it's in the case of beauty and, and physical attract, attractiveness, it's not a zero sum game. You know, it, it's, it's not as if Tom Cruise being, I'm just, pick that out of the uh, Brad Pitt. I don't know whoever you are. It's not as if because there's an attractive man that somehow demeans the position of other men, e either in a, a kind of a mating competition or in any other aspect. No. Well, there's an element, I mean, the, there's an element of zero sum. Only one, only there are only so many parts in Hollywood and they're going to go to the handsome men. If, if that's the kind of part it is. Yeah, I guess and, if you're talking about a situation, an artificial situation like China in which they've reduced the number of, of, of females or women, or girls in the society, I guess that would be part of it. So, okay, so you think that there are other values that we should think about governing our society by, and one of those is reinstituting the idea of merit. And the... And so this is what I'm taking from this. If if I haven't got it right, let, let me know, okay? And 
when someone occupies a position in which they're able to discharge the responsibilities of the, that position in aggregate, if everyone did that, the society would be better off for everyone, including people at the lowest tier. That's correct. Okay. So look, the merit involves uh, losers as well as winners. And that's, that's again, that's part of life. That's, that's, that's going to be the tragedy of some people's lives. They're not going to get. Well, you, 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 you would have to have losers. I mean, just in the, like you said, stupid people and my mentor, you'd have to have stupid people. If you don't have stupid people, then the whole concept of being smart doesn't make any sense. If you don't have failure, then there's literally nothing you can succeed at because in order to succeed, one has to fail and fail repeatedly. Well, I mean, the progressive obsession with, with equality, with it's basically uh, equity, not it's, equity. It's aspiring to a society in which everyone is the same, everyone gets the same. You know, it's fundamentally a socialist vision, and it's not a place that I want to live. Uh, I'm perfectly comfortable with inequality, and because it means that I can achieve something or try to achieve something and possibly fail at it. Uh, anyone who wants to be a writer knows the incredibly high likelihood that you won't ever get anywhere and you will never be known. And you no, know, but that, that means that, that, that it's possible to try to do something hard. And okay. So, the, 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 so let me the life in which you, you know, everyone gets the same. It doesn't matter what you do. It's, it's a it's a life of no event, no aspiration, no achievement, no satisfaction, and no heartbreak, which is also you know has its own richness. I'll throw this out, which comes from Aristotle. The okay, let me rewind the tape a little bit. I think we spent so much time focusing our educational system on self esteem, but. Aristotle writes that you don't just teach people self-esteem. You get self-esteem as a consequence of a, it's a byproduct of something like hard work. And if you remove failure from the system, you know, these playgrounds that they want to, that, that they have constructed in which they're just, there's no, there's no like concept of falling and being ouch. So I ought not to do that again. Um, so there's there's something else that's operative there, something I think that's very deep and very profound, and that's one sense of self-esteem. Yeah, I, th I think that this whole self-esteem thing in education has backfired because when you tell kids that they're already wonderful and they're they're everything that they're, they're, they're ever going to be, they, they don't have to do anything to get self-esteem. They just should esteem themselves for not doing anything. Well, it's we depressing. we, we kind of, yeah, we kind of do that in, um, Reed will post a photo here of a, a, a of a funny, uh, playground. Uh, uh, uh we, we kind of do that in fantasy based martial arts, you know, where these little kids mm -hmm. are running around with black belts who don't, I don't know if you know anything about martial arts, but, um, okay. So we had a question from someone, Reed, let's pull it up. Um, can we go back and address the question of what keeps people from falling for mass formations delusions? Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's a, a really good question. That's from Oceana 23. What keeps people from falling for mass delusions? Because it it's it can't it can't it can't it literally cannot just be intelligence because tons of intelligent people no, it isn't a lot of intelligence. Yeah. No, it isn't so it's gotta it be not intelligence. And I think there are okay, plenty good. of people of mid-range intelligence who recognize a social hysteria when they see it and 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 are immune uh, it, it it is it in fact it's it's actually the intellectual class that is often most prone to completely picking this stuff up agree. and i completely it. agree thank you so much for saying that i completely agree and that's often overlooked in these conversations okay so so then you know why why are some people again i'm i'm why are some people not subject to it? I, 
I am, I don't know. It, it almost feels genetic, honestly. I sometimes feel that there, I've got a chromosome missing or something. Uh, because it, it doesn't, they just don't infect me. And I look at it and I, really? <laughs> really? Um, and I'm afraid that uh, I'm getting the same way with the climate change thing. It's just, maybe there is something to it, but it's got all the signs of social hysteria. Especially the fact that you're not supposed to say anything against it. Like, like it, they're actually entertaining a, a law in Canada right now, which will make it literally illegal. And, and, and you'll get fined for up to 500,000 uh, Canadian dollars for saying anything contrary about climate change. And that's, that's the giveaway, you know, and, and that I mean, ultimately, of course, that's, that's intellectually insecure. So you're defending a, right. a, a, a religion more than a, a, a political or much less a scientific position. Yeah, the other problem with that is you'll never develop a positive epistemology. I don't mean a positivist. I mean, you, you'll never be able to develop the tools to figure out how to judge arguments, how to weigh what you think you know, Bayesianism, what, what, what have you. So it kind of robs people wholesale of the ability to develop arguments against positions, not even just climate change. I had not, I had not heard that. That's that's shocking to me. Let's go back to the idea of hierarchy because I find that so interesting. You know, Peterson writes about that and other people have spoken about that. In order for there to be a hierarchy, there has to be the the not only the concept of failure, but people actually have to fail at something, right? Um like the lobster hierarchy would be It's good. Yes, you yes you do. And failure is good for you. I mean, um too much failure isn't I, I will testify to that. Um, but pause. pause. Sorry. Too, so too, too much failure. Isn't too much failure a good, it might actually be good for you because it might be showing you that you're in the wrong pursuit. Like too much failure yes. for me, if I wanted to be a professional basketball player at 57. Yes. And, and while, um, you know, my biography, cause I failed I got books into print, but I was ultimately, I was a commercial failure until my seventh novel. And uh, oh. I have, I have, I'm supposed to be, you know, the little engine that could author. But I've told uh, aspirant writers, you know, at a certain point, give up. <laughs> Nobody ever tells you that, you know, that's un-American. You're supposed to keep trying and trying. But actually, there are some times that you're trying to do something that you're not going to be able to do. And you just should stop. It's not working. And it's actually, it's actually good that you know that. And failure is a, a, a way to let you know that. So, so I'm, you know, I'm thinking about the way that our systems protect people. I don't know. Have you been following this? I've been absolutely fascinated by this plagiarism scandal. Have you been following this at all? Which one? Good question. So Flooding very day. recently, it, well, it started with that and then it mm -hmm. cascaded from there. But very recently, the uh, Title IX investigator of Harvard was accused of plagiarism. And this was in the Harvard Crimson. And and the they went to the same person who said that Claudine Gay didn't plagiarize. And, and the, they, the, the, Unfortunately, she was a black woman, so that makes it more difficult. They said this is some kind of right-wing conspiracy. When you read this individual's dissertation, there is just simply no question whatsoever that that it's plagiarized. And consequently, what's entailed on that is that she obtained her credentials fraudulently. She lied. Mm -hmm. She cheated. She cheated. And then she occupied a position of power within the arguably one of the most prestigious universities in the world, maybe not now since all the scandals and the corruption. <laughs> but it is amazing to me the extent to which that institution in particular and institutions in general are either covering up or downplaying or denying, well, it doesn't have to be 
plagiarism, but the level of corruption to keep incompetent people in those positions so that there's something being overridden in their, literally in their mind. So it's not just as if they've misprioritized or their, or their moral calculus is off. There's something overriding their judgment when, I mean, you know, you don't have to go back that far, that, that far. If someone plagiarized something, that was it. I mean, that was it. You're plagiarized, you're out. Mm -hmm. I don't care what color you are. I don't care what background you're in. I don't care what school you plagiarize and at dissertation, that's it. You're out. But now, not only do we have a toleration of corruption, but we have a, a, a almost wholesale institutional cover-ups to protect people who have cheated and lied. Well, and I'm that afraid. gets back. Yeah, go ahead. Well, I'm afraid that, that, that this is hand in glove with DEI, right? Correct. And uh, all the institutions we're talking about care about is appearances, literal appearances, so that you have the right skin color and, and therefore you are, you are making the institution look just. Of course, it's likely the result of anything but a just process. But I mean, we were talking about this feedback loop. As a consequence, you know, I see someone who's the head of a corporation, or um, and and it's a you know a black woman. I can't help but think knee jerk. Oh, I know why you got that position. And this is what I mean: it perpetuates racism. I don't want to think that. I don't want that to pop in my head. But most of the time, I'm going to be right, and this is so. It, and that that will be a, an injustice in relation to the occasional black woman who earned her way up there and really deserves it and, and is great at her job. And I, I, I think the whole the whole setup is corrupt and hurts everyone. And the, I'm just thinking of our current vice president Harris. Um, uh isn't who looks wonderful on paper by the way isn't the what's the response to if there weren't these affirmative action diversity quota whatever equity based systems then black women wouldn't achieve these positions like what's the response to that there is no substitute for gradual organic change which means that little by little, I mean, after all, women in general are going to university in greater numbers than men. Correct. Um, Graduating too. And just because you might not have as many uh, black women or black people in some of the very top schools, it doesn't mean that they're not going to be in decent schools and good schools. There are lots of schools. We we over over admire the Ivies in my view, and I think you actually get kind of a crap education at most of them. Uh, but eventually, distinguished black women would filter into uh, positions of influence and it would be real it wouldn't be artificially rigged it would be deserved and and it would be self-perpetuating uh, there's no substitute for that yeah it's interesting the the uh the fulbright is a pretty prestigious i don't know if you, you follow any of these uh, awards the Rhodes is also uh, the Rhodes is the most prestigious it's in oxford scholarship uh or fellowship one can achieve and yeah but they've gone um they've gone dei also correct they are radically disproportionate numbers of minorities in those and so uh, but you notice that it that destroys the Rhodes scholarships it destroys them i mean that's the thing we're not it's not only a matter of of competence it has to do with the self-destructing quality of of these institutions that used to promote merit. And, you know, the same thing happens in literary prizes, you know, and you look at the shortlist 
and say out of six, five of them are from a minority, and yet it's a white majority country. And by the way, that's pretty standard right now. You think book buyers don't notice that, oh, I see, I get it. Nobody will say anything, but it's like, okay, it's, I can see yeah. why you chose those books. And what that means is you've corrupted the prize and you've destroyed the, the value of the prize. And you've even destroyed the commercial value of the prize. Because if someone gets the booker only because of their skin color or because they're trans or something, then then it's not it's people are not going to go buy that book not because people want to read a good book they don't want to read a, a, a something because of the identity of the author yeah that that kind of assumes though that people know that the system is corrupt if not they think oh you know roads or oh oh this is like super prestigious if they don't know that it's corrupt then then that wouldn't apply is that your dog in the background? I keep hearing a dog. It's certainly not my dog. I hate these dogs. Oh, so, I want so, them all to die. <laughs> so, oh, no. I love dogs. Um, not next door to me. Yeah, okay. I um, love dogs that shut up. Yeah. Well, you'd hate one of my dogs. Okay. So, um, uh, uh, okay. So, we've covered a wide range of subjects. I want to talk to you about, about something else. When do you find, like, what is your writing habit? When do you find time to write? Because I have terrible problems with that. Um, well, moving to Portugal was the best thing I ever did for writing novels. I have all the time in the world. I may know a few people here, but not enough. And there are just not that many distractions. So, yeah. I How just, many hours so, do you write a day? Right now, probably five or six. But then I'm um, I'm starting a novel, so I. And I what's your what's your rest? Know. So I mean, five or six hours straight, you write a day or what? Mm, pretty much, yeah. I mean, I'm not sitting there solidly typing. If you actually solidly nonstop type, and I can type pretty quickly, you can generate. 15,000 words in that amount of time. And that's not a good idea. So. Holy shit. That's crazy. No, I just I mean physically. Never... You could just, it's not that hard to generate huge numbers of words, just typing. So writing is not just typing. So there's a lot of thinking or looking things up and, you know, changing it, deleting it, etc. But by and large, not to cut you off, but nothing bores me more than writing process questions. I hate them. Uh, uh, okay. Well, I won't ask you any more writing uh, process questions, but I do know that there are some aspiring authors here who are always looking for uh, hints and suggestions about how to write right. better. Well, my, my basic line is the secret is there is no secret. Um, you just sit down and you work on it and you do it the way it works for you. And don't listen to anybody tell you how to do it. It's, it's just, there's no formula. That's what's hard about it. That's also what's fun about it. And you enjoy it. Yeah, I do. What do you What do you do most that you enjoy most? Play tennis. You any good? Mediocre. I've probably what do you plateaued. Like about I'm sure I've plateaued you know, for years. What What do you like about it? Well, it's it's. It's physical rather than sitting here talking or writing. You know, it's just a reprieve from words and thinking. Um, and it involves uh, grace. I like that feeling of connecting with the ball on the rare occasion that I do. Um, and I like the relationship. I only play singles. And actually, I don't even play games. I, 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 we play within the lines. We only let the ball bounce once. It goes what out. Do you, mean you don't play oh, games. The point like, is over. Don't. But I don't. I don't. We don't keep score. And I, I like the relationship. It's a, it's a particular kind of intimacy. It, tennis hat is a, it's a form of conversation by other means. I, my sixth novel. Uh, Double Fault is about a couple of two uh, professional tennis players 
So, I mean, I've, I've used up that subject matter, but I haven't used it up uh, in my own life. And I, I just, you, it's really nice yeah. to have something that's just in a completely different realm than where I dwell the rest of the time. Excuse me, I never considered conversation uh, tennis a form of intimacy. Mm -hmm. I do. There's something about your um, relationship with your tennis partner that's precious. Abram Verghese, I think, captured that. I've never watched a full tennis match in my entire life. But um, I want to open it up to see if anybody has any super chats to to ask questions about. If you do, uh, this is an opportunity to ask questions, and then we'll field some of those. Uh, you think you're going to live in Portugal for the rest of your life? Um, possibly. I mean, we also have a place in New York, so, you know, I go back to civilization <laughs> in the summer. Um, and New York City? Brooklyn, along with every other writer in the United States. So, yeah, yeah, I like, and that's, that's where my main tennis partner lives. So I go back there. I mean, this right now, I mean, I'm not that plugged in and it's almost like being in a, writer's retreat or something except that i don't have to put up with anyone else <laughs> it's it's you know it's contemplative and beautiful uh do you yeah, live so in lisbon hmm? you you live in lisbon just outside yeah well reed and i are going to uh lisbon next year right reed september for the uh gen spec conference What's the GenSpec conference? The GenSpec conference, Reed will put a put something up on the screen here. But if uh, you're going to be around there, we should all go out and, uh, you know, we can have some. Drink out. Portuguese Look, red wine. That's exactly what right. I was going to say. And there must oh, be you some. definitely great, give me a ring. Yeah, there must be some fantastic um, places there. But the, uh, so GenSpec is, is, uh, a conference they they discuss um gender gender ideology etc and it's quite it's quite an interesting schism my friend travis brown is uh it's in lisbon portugal september 2024 my friend travis brown is doing a documentary on uh, gender issues transition medical detransitioning etc and he mm -hmm. has some fantastic stuff his first documentary was the woke reformation he comes from a uh, really interesting position of uh, having growing up in a Christian cult. Mm. Um, okay, cool. Is there anything else you want to talk about that I didn't, that I didn't cover? Well, we talked about maybe talk, uh, discussing immigration, but it's a big subject. So I don't know whether we've got time. <laughs> yeah, it's probably big, too, too big for the last, but I was really interesting that that was not one of the reasons that you said you moved. It is. It is. Oh, it is. It is. Oh, and yeah, when I asked I initially, that it, didn't it happen didn't to remember up, but... to list it because my reasons for leaving the UK are so numerous. Um, but that's Let's certainly see. up there. Yeah. I mean, it, can you just Portugal has some modest amount of immigration? They tend to privilege uh, Angola, for example, because it's a former colony. Oh, yeah. Yeah, but for the Portuguese. most part, this is this is a culturally coherent place. It is full of Portuguese people, shockingly enough. And uh, <laughs> I uh, kind of had it with living in London. I lived in a, a neighborhood that used to be a white working class area. Everyone knew everyone else. Now, I wasn't there during this halcyon period, or that's the way the few people who were left like that think of it. They used to leave their doors open. And... Uh, and now it's almost all immigrants and it's a big social housing area. So many of these people are n not paying for their housing or not paying full freight for their housing. And it's, it's, it's not, it doesn't feel as if you're in England. I mean, and you're not effectively, you're not because you're not, there aren't any English people. And that, I, I don't know whether you followed what's happened with, with London, but I think I it's have. down to about, was it 30, 
35 to 37% white British. And I just did a, go ahead. No, I mean, it's mostly just, people who weren't born there. It, 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 it's, it's in the forefront of the cities that have simply been completely colonized by the rest of the world. And I mean, yeah, yeah, nice restaurants, but it doesn't, it's, it's a symptom of something that's gradually happening to Europe in general. And certainly, you know, the U S is in there as well. And it just is a feeling of, um, not, um, a place that doesn't know what it, what or who it is anymore. And, um, furthermore, a lot of these people have been attracted by a very generous, uh, benefits situation that doesn't require them to make any contribution first. Uh, what they regard as free healthcare, but though if you pay for it, it certainly doesn't feel free. Uh, Cause yeah, it's, it's a lot of your taxes. A, and it's, it's a, um, so that the feeling also is just of being surrounded by people who are taking advantage and that's not a good atmosphere. Um, it's a kind of scammy feeling. And, uh, and I, I, you know, on a more positive front, I, I, if I'm going to live in a foreign country, I like the fact that th this country is, you know, of a piece. And if I'm going to participate, I need to learn something about Portuguese culture and the Portuguese language. It's, it's a small country. It's only got 11 million people in it. It's incredible. Yeah. But it still has a cultural integrity, which I appreciate. They, you know, it's not an empire anymore. It's it's accustomed to its modesty in world affairs. So, you know, it's certainly not white supremacist by any means, but it is. It still seems to know what it is. It's still, and it has a quiet pride uh and i i i appreciate that and 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 it, it makes me feel foreign which is fine because that's what i am and and i i feel the fabric of the uk really starting to shred there, there's so many towns because of course there's all this self segregation, which Americans know plenty about. Um, so whole towns just uh, become completely South Asian, and if they're and then they will sometimes further self segregate into the Indians and the Pakistanis. And um, the, the UK Something is letting like in so many people from elsewhere, generally not from Europe anymore so fast and the feeling is you know you're just you're giving away your birthright and uh i know it's an awkward it's an awkward topic uh obviously it intersects with religion and race but you know you don't have to let in over a million people a year in a in a in a country with 68 million people in it uh for very long to completely change the composition of your population. And that's what they're doing. Okay. Is that, and uh, what makes it different from the United States is that the biggest problem is legal immigration. They're letting these people in, they're giving them long-term visas. Uh, whereas in the U S the real problem is illegal immigration. I had a wonderful conversation with Matt Goodwin and Eric Kaufman about that. And Actually, I had two conversations. I saw that. Yeah, I, they're uh, both uh, colleagues of mine. Yeah, it was a very, very interesting conversation. And if people in the in the chat hasn't haven't seen it, I'd recommend it. And I really one like of the Matt's things I appreciate about their arguments is there's a certain there's a certain bravery to this because uh, this whole immigration issue is usually talked about in, in purely economic terms. 
So it's a matter yeah, of, yeah. you know, oh, oh, are they long-term benefit or, or are they an economic drain? Um, but both Matt and Eric are willing to stick their necks out and say, you know, this isn't just about money. This is also about culture. This is about uh, people feeling at home in their own country. And that's where it's really hitting people emotionally. And the economic argument is used uh, on both sides, but that's not really what people are most upset about. I know Britons do get upset about the idea of their benefit systems and the, and the national health system service being, being abused because, you know, that costs them in taxes. But the heart of the matter is that, that sensation of home and, feeling like how did you know I'm completely surrounded by foreigners nothing against them if they were in their own countries but now they're in my country how did it, how did we get here and I you know the the trouble is that once you remove the concept of culture from the concept of a nation and also you just say anybody can come there in any quantity, then you don't really have a country. You just have a patch on a map. All it is is a place. And the United States has to wrestle with this also. I know we've got this whole mythology about, oh, we're a nation of immigrants. You know, oh, we, we all came from somewhere else. But that doesn't mean that it didn't, you know, that, that we weren't still dealing with a certain rough cultural coherence. And Earlier immigrants as well were expected to assimilate. We're not. We don't. We don't expect assimilation anymore. And furthermore, we haven't been very honest with ourselves about the fact that the vast majority of immigrants to the United States, aside from Black Americans, who were the first immigrants in some ways, uh, <laughs> in the ugliest way possible, but a subsequent uh, waves of immigration were all coming from Europe. And while they were perceived as radically different, you know, and and the, as, quote, the other, in a larger civilizational sense, they were still from the same larger place. And that made that assimilation much easier. And now we're taking in people from all over the world. And that, that, that European coherence that we never really acknowledged at the time is being completely disrupted. And, and I, you know, there's a real question as to how fractured, how, how ethnically, religiously, racially fractured a country can be and still keep it together. And, you know, mm -hmm. this is happening, this, this latest huge wave of immigration is happening at the same time that it is now fashionable to be anti-white, uh, anti-American, anti-Western. And so, you know, we have people flocking to the United States and yet, uh, why should they? You know, it's, 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 it's evil, it's the viper's nest of racism. So we're not encouraging people to assimilate into a country that we think is evil. And it's, it's, it is also an issue of enormous emotion that we have more or less told people that they can't express. The emotions, and yeah, these, these are, these are they're, they're not all nice emotions. Resentment, um, uh, anger, uh, a sense of being occupied, but when you push people too far, really numerically, I think that there's a kind of tip of tipping point because there are lots of people who are perfectly happy to have a steady, slow stream of newcomers from somewhere else. And, you know, it, it introduces in, it, interesting people, a new element in your society. But, this, but at the same time, you're you're also expecting them to get with the program and to join the larger nation. Uh, 
but once you push people, as I said, numerically, proportionally, put enough people in too fast, you start triggering what I think are pretty primitive instincts. And, you know, we're animals. And that feeling of invasion, I mean, we're told we're, we can't use that word, which is another sign, you know, whenever you're told you can't use a word, it's true. Uh, that feeling, it does, it's not necessarily racial. I mean, this is another column that got me into big trouble, but people are political animals and we form groups. The, the fact that the human race is one big happy family is a nice conceit, but that's not our nature. So we form groups and we form loyalty to groups. You could put together any group that has a majority in a country, and then it's suddenly infiltrated by huge numbers of people from somewhere else. The majority resents it and gets very angry. And in some instances, even in, even expels them. And this happens all over the world. It's not just white people. I mean, the South Africans uh, can't stand all these immigrants from Zimbabwe. The Colombians really resent all these immigrants from Venezuela. And now we're getting them. Uh, the, uh, the situation between Nigeria and Ghana, I think it was, uh, they threw out. Uh, hundreds of thousands of Ghani Ghanese because, because there had been too many coming across the border too fast and you trigger that, you know, who are these people? And, uh, you know, that emotion is so primitive. I, I think it's dangerous. And, and, you know, I've been very, very disappointed in Biden on this one because you know, I, I read a lot of newspaper comments, and even in the New York Times, uh, the fury on this point of a, an effectively open border uh, with Mexico is through the roof. And these are often self-professed Democrats, liberals. Something's been triggered in them. Of course, it it's very apparent on their streets right now. But that, we're, we're told we, we're, we can't express these feelings, that this, this is, we're supposed to be welcoming. Uh, it doesn't matter who pe where people are from. Everyone is the same. This is the left thing. Everyone's the same. Um, and if anything, if they're not the same, then minority populations are superior. But, you know, what's happening in both the UK and the US is way too fast, way too much, and it's asking for trouble as well as total national incoherence. I don't even know where to begin with that. <laughs> there, was, there was so much there. There, there. there was just there was just so much there. That we should have you read, we should we should have her on again for another show to talk about immigration. I, I find it to be absolutely fascinating. And I it's so morally complex. And that's one of the things that fascinates me about it. But so maybe in person in September, maybe in person we'll yeah, have I'd love to do that. Because be I I mean I'm, I'm interested in the fact that especially in fiction, and I include film and television, um that stories about immigrants are always rigged to prefer the immigrant. I think there's something structural about, about the narrative of, of the disadvantaged newcomer always going to be the winning character. No one ever writes in defense of the interests and feelings of the native population. And, uh, that's actually what I'm working on right now. And boy, is it difficult. Oh, really? Interesting. All right. Let's just, we have a, we have a, a, a super chat and you've been extremely generous with your time. I appreciate it from Stephen Dodds for five bucks. If climate change is real, why do our leaders completely disregard it? Obama has a seaside property. Trudeau flies private. 
uh, across the country regularly. I do think that that anthropogenic cli climate change is is real. Uh, Dorian Abbott has some great stuff on this. I interviewed him on the show and other people. And for at a more basic level, that one does not need to be an atmospheric scientist. The Ske Skeptic magazine has covered some stuff on this. But so so why are our leaders? I don't know our leaders. I'm not Canadian and. But why are world leaders flying to Davos and jets, and wh why are they, why do they have multiple large properties, and why wh where's the disconnect? Well, first off, they probably don't really believe it, and they're just posturing. Um, and and furthermore, they that uh, uh, the rules don't apply to them, and that's true of most people who make the rules. They don't think they apply to them. Yeah, like Gavin Newsom, I'm here in L.A., Gavin Newsom having strict lockdowns and then himself being uh, going out to dinner with his friends at a nice restaurant. Um, that level of hypocrisy is mind-blowing. Um, okay, cool. So I really enjoyed our conversation. I, I appreciate it. We'll, we'll see you in September. Where can people find you? Where, where, like, where Do you have a, a homepage or a base? Are you on uh, formerly known as Twitter? Are you on X? Nope. <laughs> Well, I don't do the social media. Ever happened to. Yeah, you can. Uh, where can, you can where can people find your your books? I know you write for the Spectator, and you've written for just about everything. But um, you can always write my my publisher or the Spectator. And uh, if you want to keep up up with what I'm thinking, I have a fortnightly column in the Spectator that I've written since 2017, and I'm keeping it up from Portugal. Um, after all, I've got access to all the same media, uh, and therefore it's not that, it's not that hard to get hold of me. I feel sometimes as if half the world has my email address. Really? God, that would be my worst nightmare. Uh, fortnightly, you yeah, I don't recommend fortnightly. I, I can tell you've been, you've been, um, living in the UK on that island for a long time to use the word fortnightly. Now I never hear Americans use that word. Every two weeks for those have to bi weekly that means people. two things. Mm. So fortnightly is more precise. A fortnight is two weeks. Yes. And bi weekly bi -weekly means... can mean every two weeks or twice a week. Yeah, I use it to mean twice a week. Uh, but that's just, that's just me. Well, great. Well, uh, thank you so much. I really want to, want to thank you, Lionel, for having, for coming on the show, for talking, talking to me and, and you've given me a lot to chew about, a lot to think about, and I definitely appreciate your time. Uh, so thank you. Well, I've, uh, I've enjoyed any number of your own podcasts with other people <laughs> and, uh, I'm honored to, to join the, the list. And oh, uh, I'll continue to keep up with with your interviews. You, you get some great people and and uh, give them a lot of time to expand on what they think and push, appreciate them, it. I'm, push them where thank they need you. to be pushed. I'm, I'm working on uh, I'm, I'm, I'm working on being a better interviewer. So I, I appreciate that. All right. Uh, stay, stick around uh, and uh, we'll talk to you after the show. All right. Thanks, everybody, for listening. We appreciate your time, and we'll see you soon. Thank you for watching. Everything we do is under the umbrella of the National Progress Alliance, nationalprogressalliance.org. It's a nonprofit, independent 501c3. Your generous donations keep us going and keep fueling content like this. So please help us out. Make a donation. We very much appreciate it. Thank you.